Welcome to Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. Each week, the NI Bullpen will be covering the world of comics, talking to creators, deep diving into some fantastic stories, and much more. Now let's hand it over to the team and turn a page. And what is going on, everyone? It is Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you are tuned into the Nerd Initiative Network for another edition of Turn a Page, the official comic book club of the Nerd Initiative Comic Bullpen. What is going on? I'm Ken M. You know me as the host of the ODPH podcast, but I'm also Nerd Initiative's comics editor in chief. Ordinarily, he'd be to my right, your left, but he's in the diagonal square underneath me here, so I will let him take it away from the Fortress of Awesomeness, as I believe he calls it. <laughs> the Sanctum of Awesome coming at you live and direct. Yes, the Megazord happens to have some battle damage right now, so I'm pulling this one from home. I am Off the Cuff Tom, Nerd Initiative, Pop Culture Connoisseur. As always, a pleasure. Absolutely. And joining us, our other co host you know him as one half of the dynamic duo of drafts and dialogue, bringing you that pop culture knowledge you need to know each and every week. It's Matt from Hops Geeks News. What's up? It's like the Brady Bunch, right? We're all looking in every box, looking down. It's like all the lights are up. There Wasn't there like a game show, too, at one point that kind of did that same thing? That's how Hollywood it feels. Squares. Hollywood Squares. Yeah, yeah. Hollywood yeah. Squares. I'll take Paul in the block. <laughs> That's what it feels yeah. like. No, it's awesome. And we, we, we Goldberg the in the center. <laughs> Yes. And joining us on this very special edition of Turn a Page is a fantastic writer who has three books out right now at the comic shops. You absolutely have to have in your collection. And if you don't, by the end of this episode, you click on that QR code at the corner of the screen, find your local comic shops, go down there and make sure you add these titles to your collection. You know his work from such titles as The Flash, Detective Comics, Injustice, Chicken Devil, and many, many others. Please welcome to the show the writer of Midlife, co-writer of No One, and the writer of Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, the one and only Brian Bucciolato. Brian, what is going on? Hello. Happy to be here. Happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming through. And like we say, you have three amazing books at the comic shops right now. They're absolutely crushing it. But the one that I I resonate to the most, the one I think more fans need to have in their collection and be talking about is Midlife or How to Be a Hero at 50. This is a book that is a vibe all itself. It is one that stands out from everything else going on. So, Brian, if nobody's uh, you know not too familiar with this book, let's break it down. What is Midlife all about? Uh, so Midlife is about a legacy firefighter, uh, a guy who is uh, 50 when the first movie starts. Um, his father was like this hero firefighter who uh, died in a lot of duty. And so he felt like he had to live in his father's footsteps. He joins uh, LAFD. Um, but one thing is he's deathly afraid of fire. So you, you fast forward 25 years and he's lived this uh, sort of unremarkable life. Uh, and feels all this shame because he's been a desk jockey for 25 years and he hasn't lived up to um, his father's legacy. Uh, on his 50th birthday, he finds out his second wife is pregnant and he's going to be a father again at the age of 50, which is somewhat autobiographical. Uh, that drives him towards an act of courage uh, where he runs into a fire to save a dog and he finds out that he is fireproof. And uh, from there, he feels like this is his chance to become a hero and uh, live up to his father's legacy. So it's literally a hero at 50. Dang. It's an amazing, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Matt. No, I was just saying, dang. Yeah, I think like Ken said, it's something that we can kind of resonate with. Um, you know, I, I know Brian's dad and I know myself as a dad. It's I see a lot of, you kind of get stuck. Like your your life is serving your kids and it's you kind of get stuck in the, well, what am I doing? for either yourself, the greater good kind of things. I mean, it's easy for you. You're writing some amazing comic books. Uh, yeah. But, you know, not everybody feels like they're they're doing that. A lot of people just get stuck in these ruts. So I think for a lot of people, it's something they could easily resonate with, right? I mean, and then firefighters are one of those unsung heroes that don't really get the recognition they always deserve. So I think twofolds, you did two really amazing things with this book right off the bat, um, is connecting with a greater general audience there who – Maybe they're feeling superhero burnout, but if they are, this one is just the average man finding out he's spectacular. And I think people should really be picking this up. 
Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I mean, if uh, if uh, Radiant Black is the millennial superhero, then uh, uh, Midlife is the Gen X superhero. Yes. <laughs> I absolutely fully believe that because, like I say, it's just got such a unique vibe to it. And especially, too, about going into, like, you know, how did the whole creative process for this come about and putting together a creative team for this? Um, I met Spawn through Kyle, Kyle Higgins, who I just previously mentioned, uh, uh, as someone on a couple other projects that I was putting together. And uh, so when, uh, what fed into this one was my experience uh, at Aftershock doing Chicken Devil, which was also somewhat uh, biographical in that it was a, you know, middle-aged guy who uh, is sort of like put in the position of Punisher. He's a regular dude who makes really good hot chicken uh his uh his partner gets uh, involved with the mob and the mob uh, blows up a boat with his uh, family on it um and so he has to go on this sort of revenge kick but he's never been in the army he doesn't know how to shoot a gun and so it was literally me saying like how would i brian get revenge how would i become the punisher if, if someone killed my family if the mob killed my family and so that was like me diving into like a part of myself that's you know there's a lot of absurdity it's a funny book it's like bloody you know it's gory like he fails upward um it's you know and it's called chicken devil because uh he wears the mascot suit um uh, for his restaurant which is a chicken in a devil suit because it's hot chicken um and so it's just like this crazy thing but it, it really sort of tapped into something i ha hadn't done previously like my creator owned books were more like horror based and like darker serious things and of course the comic stuff you know injustice you know all that stuff you find moments where you can put in like a, a you know, the comedic yeah. side of your life or, or a little bit of yourself in, but it, it's not the same as sort of just tapping into who you are as a person. Like I'm way more goofy and, and absurd, I think, than uh, you would think you're reading just Injustice or a horror book, you know? So, <clears throat> so that was a great experience. I loved it so much that I, like, I have to repeat this experience. And so um, uh, my brother-in-law, my, my wife's uh, sister's, uh, his husband um, works. He's a firefighter, and he uh, and uh, he was going to have a kid of fifty, and I had already had a kid of fifty, and so it's something just sparked out of that, and I was like, "Wait a second, you're fifty? You had a kid at fifty? You look like you're like thirty-five, dude. Wait a second, uh, fifty-three. Ain't no way. I don't believe. Holy. No way. Pull out the birth certificate. What? A no way, dude. So you know, I know you guys know Kyle. His favorite game in the world to play is guess how old Brian is. To people that don't know me. <laughs> you'd lose you yeah. would win the, the money every time there was no 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 yeah. way well, wow. I'm, so my, i'm half puerto rican right? my, my mom's puerto rican so i got like those good genes and i just look like, <laughs> you know, she's always looked way younger than she is and so i just i'm thankful that uh i, I got some of that uh you know drinking from the fountain the of youth, man seriously that is awesome wow. <laughs> I, I was i had to sit there for a second and be like did i hear this right no way yeah, no, I've got a three-year-old, a six-year-old, and a twenty-three-year-old. Uh, so, yeah. My uh, so I can kind of somewhat like my as my mother's parents, they had two more kids. One when she, my ma mother-in-law was forty-one, and the other one she was forty-three. So, they kind of I got got to see some of that aspect uh, of what you're talking about too. But man, like, didn't mean to detract there for a second. That just blows me. No, away. It's right. crazy. <laughs> but speaking... no, I mean, I've... oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go, go, gonna, no, go right ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that like this all kind of brings everything you said, you know, having a kid at 50 and uh, your brother-in-law having just had a kid um, continue, please, from there. Yeah, no, it's just, you know, it, it, first of all, I'm Gen X, right? So, like, uh, we're, we're, like, inherently, like, melancholy and, and reflective, I think, from the age of, like, five. I don't know, you know, that's just a trait, I think, of my generation. Um, yeah. But, like, looking back at your life and... You know, no matter where you are along this path, like I think you always look back and, and, and say, did I do enough? Did I try hard enough? Am I where I, I wanted to be? And and I think people tend to judge themselves pretty harshly. So uh, that was really the start of the story uh, about finding finding like a, a family drama with this one genre twist um, and, and just running with it. And, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's heartfelt, but I think it's also... Uh, it's light and serious at the same time because it's like a grunt, you know, there's a suspension of disbelief when you add superpowers to any story. So like on some level you have to do that, you know? Right. So. Uh, 
what was this like then, you know, being kind of creative focused? Cause there are a lot of people might know your work, like Ken said, the flash or, you know, detective comics getting to kind of create your own character and playing your own universe. What is that like for you taking a step back from those bigger issues to something you have more control over? Well, I mean, it, they feed two different sides of like the creative part of you and the ego part of you. Cause you know, let's, let's be serious. Anybody who wants to write uh, has an ego because they feel like they have something to say that other people should listen to or read or hear. So there is an ego component to it. Um, and so when you get to, to you know, write, you know, Flash or Superman, Batman, these characters, these iconic, you know, what, 75, 80 year old characters, yeah. like you're feeding the child in you that it's like, wow, I, I'm actually getting to take part in this huge, you know, long, illustrious um, uh, history. And so that feeds, you know, you in a certain way. Um, but what it doesn't feed is the sort of ownership, like it's mine, it's my world, I get to I get to be the one who has the final say over everything because you know when when you have an image book um you know you're your own boss you know image doesn't uh, sort of interfere uh in terms of the creative side of things and so like you you're you really are able to put it out there for better or for worse if people like it great if they don't well you know you gave it your best shot so um it's two totally different but great opportunities that you know i think any writer uh would be really really thankful you know to experience now you were touching on the whole generational thing. Um, what's interesting that, you know, with the four of us all right here, uh, at, well, out of the three of us, cause you've already, you know, gave it away. Ken being the oldest, technically a, a Gen Xer. All right. I am a millennial on the X side, heavy on mm -hmm. the X side. And Matt's the wee one. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> having that said, you know, one thing I really liked about reading midlife is the fact that you do these throwbacks. I mean, issue one, bat nips right there <laughs> you know oh, it, it's, it's so nice to <laughs> finally get a, a writer that is writing to us not for us but to us that we have these cultural references that we can go bat nips of all things you know how important <laughs> was that for you to put in those very particular musical and cultural references and then on top of that been, this being creator owned and having written for so many other uh projects what was it like designing the character? Yeah, the, the designing of the character I'll handle first. It was with you know in concert with uh, Stefano Simeone, who's an amazing artist. Mm -hmm. um, he's I, I just love everything that he does. Uh, it was just a lot of conversations with him, and then letting him take him, you know take a stab at it. Uh, the one piece of reference I gave him was that I, I found online like an old um, weird firefighter helmet thing that that almost looked like a like a deep sea thing, but it was it was a historical firefighter type helmet. And so that's what his helmet is. And the rest, it was just like, I was like, you know, in story, uh, the costume is built by his friend who creates costumes for superheroes. So it was like, do some, do that version. What's the MCU, you know, like superhero or, you know, WB, whatever, like, like so that's, that's really how that went. Um, uh, what was the first first part of the question? Cultural references and writing. Culture, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I was I was writing to myself. You know what I mean? Like uh, I wasn't writing for. I wasn't preaching to. I was just writing something that felt like an authentic experience for me. So that I, I the hope is in turn there's other people out there who identify with that and, and they see that the either the specific appeal or the universal appeal because you don't have to be you know, my age, you know, or Ken's age, right, to, to feel those mm -hmm. things. You know, I think some of the things that he's going through, uh, um, you know, universal, but the specificity, and this is something that I learned as a writer, you know, like writing to an audience or, or trying to be too broad or trying to, you know, write to, to too many people um, is less remarkable. It's less memorable. Um, it doesn't resonate. Uh, I think specificity is actually the key to great writing and, and to finding people who uh, who respond to your material. I think you have to know who you are and what you have to say and understand, you know, you know what you have to say that, you know, is genuine and heartfelt and hope that you find the audience for that. So, so for me, just, you know, pulling things that I know, like, I don't know if you guys uh, picked up on that, but uh, the flashback where you see is how uh, you see him as a kid in, in the dining room with his mom and his friends. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's the uh, that's the uh, living room from ET. Oh wow! If you go back and you look at it with, with the chandelier and the whole thing, that's oh my god, yeah, 
I'm pulling that's this up right now. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's a little so cool. Easter eggs like that. You know, like I, I would send all kinds of reference to Stefano just because it, it's fun for me to, to do that. And if anyone you know sees it, the outside of the house, uh, see if you recognize what the outside of the house is. Triangular table. Uh, okay. Oh, no. Outside of the house. I'm looking at it right now. I'm, I'm in 1986. I see, like, while Tom's figuring that out, I think one of my favorite references you dropped was the whole, like, Blade Marvel debate. You're like, I don't want to work on this mm -hmm. trash. Blade, it's, a, it's another crappy Marvel. And then it's the one movie that, like, obviously kind of saved the MCU today. It's like those kind of throwbacks are, that's what got me hooked yeah. instantly. Is that Back well, to I'm the having... Future? No, so so it's not fair it's, because it be it's actually, it's not, it's not from 86. It's from, it's from the early 90s. Full House, I don't know. <laughs> And it's it's the it's um it's John Connor's uh oh, oh, dude. oh <laughs> man. I'm gonna have to go reread uh, this tonight. There, there, there are a couple yeah. people who, who actually picked up on that. Um but you know stuff like that's uh is definitely like like fun to do. Um uh but we okay, I'm gonna keep walking across me here. <laughs> Perfectly okay in my book. Hello, handsome. <laughs> <laughs> She's her name is Little Kitty because she's a very little kitty. Um, I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted. What was uh, where are we now? No, you're, no, you're we're talking totally... about you no, know, we're talking we just, just about the moment. Easter eggs you're putting in. Yeah, like I say, talking about no. you know the John Connor house and just you know the other elements you're adding into it, especially when you do those throwbacks. Because, like, for you know, like for me, it's like I it resonates so much that like now I have to go back and reread because now I'm like, I, I thought that was it, but I'm like not sure. and you know, it's just something about taking that time period and making it relevant today without feeling dated. Because like I say, even though it's a flashback, the themes still resonate. And that even carries to Ruben's character now that obviously dealing with living in his father's shadow, trying to emerge as whatever hero he's going to be. And then obviously the outside force is coming into play, which after issue number four, there was a little bit of drama that, uh, you yeah, know, that uh, there was a certain pair that was trying to track him down a little bit and, uh, you know, yeah. see what's going on with the Mr. Midway. Maroon suits, as I call them. Yeah. Yes. You know, like I say, when you start seeing that, now he's getting thrown into a world that he doesn't really know about and kind of walking through that journey too. It's just something that no matter what your age is, this, the superhero concept is just timeless, wouldn't you say? I think it is. You know, I think, you know, that we... Uh, there's something very, very American, very childhood, very like primal about superheroes. I think that's why, you know, they still exist, even though, you know, I know the publishing as a medium, you know, has taken some hits over the years, especially with, you know, new generations and, and the different way they consume entertainment. But like, it's, it's, it's just a part of us. Like it, it taps into that, that child, I mean, the childlike wonder and nothing to me, encapsulates that more than whenever I see a picture of Christopher Reeve as Superman, like that to me is the moment in my head, you know? Um, so I think, I think that it's there in a lot of us. And so it's, I don't think it's that hard to tap into it and to, to try to create from that and have people, you know, like you guys, you know, thankfully respond to it. Well, I think it's you one know? of those things too. Like as a kid, you talk about, there's something just natural, we want to, as kids, we were so full of imagine. This is before life, you know, beats you down in a way, right? Metaphorically, you're so full of wonder. You you want to save the world, and so I think that's why, like, soup. There's something just so magical about superheroes. Being like, wow, um, I read this thing that was basically kids fall in love with dinosaurs first because it's the first thing they see that are bigger than their parents. And I also feel, in a way, superheroes are kind of like that because as kids, we always view our parents as these heroes. Whereas superheroes, you know, they're larger than life. And it's something that will resonate and sticks with a lot of us. It sticks with me. I mean, we all here are here today because we love superheroes, you know, at our core. So it's always really interesting. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I mean, MCU is on the, you know, maybe, maybe they're not doing as well as they did in the first 10 years. But like, you know, whenever a good superhero movie comes out people go to it I mean, spider-verse movies and probably you know the best movie in the last few years that's a superhero movie audience oh, yeah. three was good like you know if, if the movies are good people will come out to them oh without a doubt oh. for sure yeah if the th yeah if the story is good people always turn out for it and that's the one great thing with midlife too is it can connect even with younger readers and older readers like myself like there's just something in there for everybody because like i say the artwork is phenomenal it feels very new and then the story, 
you know, is very relatable. And then as it's going on for, you know, obviously this is a regular series and we're going into, you know, the end of the first arc, so to speak. Is there anything you can kind of elaborate about what's going to happen? Um, he's going to get some closure on some things. I think there's some questions that are outstanding in his life that, that are sort of at the core of, of some of his troubles emotionally. Like, I don't want to give away too much, but um, I, I think there, there will be some closure. Uh, I think part of that is also because I know Stefano has other, um, um, you know, other, other commitments and the trade's going to come out. So it'll be a little while before we, we continue on with it. Uh, that's part of the sort of the new world order with with comics these days. You know, like comics that can continue month to month. It's really, really, really hard if you're not big too. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's, all, it's darn near impossible. So uh, I think uh, I wanted to finish the first arc uh, with the sense of a of a not a, a, the end of the story, but the end of like, a chapter. Um, so I think that you know, hopefully I've earned that. Uh, in the story and when people read it they'll feel satisfied um but obviously there's more to come yeah no i'm I'm super excited to see where this is all going like i say ever since Thanks. it's come out it's been one that's been on my pull list and we've been reviewing it uh, between myself and marty soaked who's in the chat there and like we go back and forth about it too it's just like how good this is and just how it's a story that more people need to read in my opinion because like i say it, it defies age which i know is kind of with the tagline too and it just proves that you know, anybody can be a superhero no matter what, as long as you have the theme and the belief behind it. And I think that's just, that's a message that needs to be related in this day and age. Yeah. I mean, it, oddly it's hopeful. It's a hopeful book. Like, like he's a good person. I know, I know it's, you know, like that may not be the sexiest, you know, like log line for, for a hero, but he's a good person. He has a good heart and he's just mm -hmm. trying to do what he thinks is best. And, Let's you know, remember that um, there's a whole genre of, of, of the fair of the species that likes the dad bods. So let's, you know, you hey, dad bods are back in, uh, man. All right. Just saying. Especially uh, the ones yeah. who wear Duncan. That's right. I got fair that. Enough. I bought the jacket. But, uh, side, you know, what's funny is you mentioned this. And now I've read two stories, two really, really creator owned books from the same company now. And I think that you guys have a niche. I think there's a niche out there that is untapped and it's like this everyday man becoming hero because we have midlife and then we also there was another one from uh the schlub was another one and the, these two stories are very like these everyday men and they're just stories that help catch on especially midlife because i think again a lot of people can resonate that especially in the modern world where we're all kind of right now looking for that hero right we're we're out there and just a lot of us especially as dads carry that weight um so i'm really really hoping it kind of it finds, you know what, Bradley? Me too, man. Me too. All right. Yeah, no shame. No shame, Bradley. There's no shame in the dad bod. <laughs> be rad. Be rad. Uh, now, with all this creator stuff that's going on, you know, you have a, a, a lot of fantastic stories out there. You, coincidentally, you also have no one. So tell us about no one. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have been reading stuff in, you know, the, the massive verse and what if they got to catch up with it that's a funny comment and thing. sorry threw me off uh, <laughs> um yeah no one is uh, a different corner of the masterverse so uh you know the different titles you don't necessarily have to read them uh together uh, just because like they operate in different cities and it's all by design um no one is uh what do i what do i call it i, I like to call it sort of um the wire meets like gotham central with the a, a vigilante hero um, it's a really ambitious, big swing, um, uh, maybe a little bit of science of the lens. It, it, it said, uh, there's a serial killer. It's, it's a city, um, uh, it's a city with, uh, that's, that's struggling with a serial killer who is targeting, uh, powerful corrupt people and a vigilante, uh, comes into the picture to try and stop, um, what's going on. And, uh, part of the problem is that this vigilante started it by being sort of like anonymous, uh, with chief by, um, uh, doxing and, and outing, uh, these corrupt, powerful people and demanding that they be held accountable. Uh, well, they weren't held accountable by, uh, the justice system in, in the city. Uh, it's in Pittsburgh. Um, and so, uh, what happens is they, it, somebody takes it upon themselves to start killing these people. Uh, and becomes like the serial killer who sort of takes over the city uh, for, um, you know, for 12 months. So the story takes place over 12 months and 
It's very dense. Uh, it's, uh, it revolves around uh, the newspaper and uh, these two reporters who are in charge of doing a true crime in-world podcast, uh, trying to identify who the hero is called No One. Um, and we actually did the podcast. So there's 10 episodes uh, that when you buy the comic book, when you finish reading the comic book, there's a QR code and yep. you can uh, go to the podcast and it's um, it's Pat Oswald and Rachel Lee Cook are the two, uh, t- the two leads. And they are basically doing, uh, you know, uh, giving added value to the story by, you know, this is their podcast. They're trying to find out who is no one, uh, with just all these other factors. And uh, they find that it's very difficult to find any kind of truth in, in this sort of like corrupt society with, you know, all these different agendas. Um, you've got the police department, you've got the vigilante, you have a, uh, an ex-cop whose son is responsible for some of the killing. It's, it's like a really mm-hmm. dense, rich world that is not necessarily an easy read, but I think it's a rewarding, a rewarding read. Uh, and it also has like ARG elements. Uh, there's like, there's newspaper articles and there are other things that like all add value to this sort of like, like a cross media multi-platform experience. Now, when you guys yeah. are planning this one out, Oh, I'm sorry, Ken, you want to? No, no, I was going to say, uh, no, Tom, do you take it? Cause I, I got, I got a question I've been meaning to ask. So it's okay. Involving okay, no one. So- so. So when you were figuring out this whole multimedia experience that you wanted to do with no one, what was it like putting out like the sides or did we just call up a friend and say, Hey, has anybody got, you know, uh, Ratatouille and Josie from Josie and the Pussycats on, <laughs> online just so you know, there's your cultural yeah, that's, reference. That's all Kyle. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Uh, that's all Kyle. Like, like, like he, he does, he's been doing a lot of cons. Uh, I stepped away from comics for a number of years. And in that time, like I swear he met everybody that was ever in, at a convention and he just forged a lot of relationships. And so he had a deep uh, pool of people that he knew personally that he can pull from. And so that's how, how we got people um, uh, into, you know, you know like, uh, you know, Todd Stashwick is, is in there and he, he was on, you know, the, the Star Trek show, The uh, Strange New World. Um, Great job. Amazing job on that character. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. And there, there's, I mean, you know, there's a pair, there's, you know, there's Power Rangers in, in our, in our, uh, cast <laughs> um so like you know there, 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 there's a lot there's a lot uh, there's a lot going on there um and uh, the hardest part about it i mean this is probably the most ambitious undertaking we've ever had for a comic book like we we worked on a document for a year before we did page one on, on the first issue like i have like a hundred a hundred page document so slides like of all wow. this information there's so, so, many so you have the bible Oh. <laughs> it's a bible but it's but it's like a um it's on google slides so it's a, it's a bible oh so so we have a powerpoint you know see that's showing his age he's a gen xer can we convert yeah. it to pdf uh, i think you can i think you can <laughs> go ahead Ken. um so no, like well my my one question then i gotta just ask uh all right so i'll ask my fan question first has no one the identity obviously we don't know yet is it a character that we've seen yet in the comic yes can you at least say that Ooh, yes he did say yes. That. Okay, yes. okay okay okay, okay. all right because i've gone back and forth about who my guess is about who it is and it's like the only person i've ruled out is teddy i don't think it's teddy by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> Next issue, need, uh, it's teddy. yeah it's gonna serious. be teddy and we're gonna circle back to this he's gonna be laughing like oh, you idiot <laughs> Yeah, I just I can I can't safely say it's not Teddy. I, I can safely say it's not Teddy. Also, I, I don't want to lead you guys astray. <laughs> okay, but with I mean, obviously, you've written some fantastic detective stories and detective comics, and now being creator owned, uh, or going in with this, like, how have you described like the differences in this? Like, have you said like I really wanted to do this with Batman, but I couldn't, but now I can really run with this with no one. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, my run on, on Detective with Francis, you know, uh, I wrote that with him. He um, he drew it and I colored it. Um, uh, it started out as a this really great experience um, because we were in our own little corner of the Bat universe in the New 52, um, and we were allowed to do detective stories. And then there was the big event where James Gordon becomes Batman. Yeah. And, and so we were sort of forced into that, and it kind of took the theme out of what we were doing. So I did always feel like, you know, we didn't finish our run because we got pushed into something. And, and then, and then the, you know, that version of Batman with Gordon 
wasn't something that enabled to Francis and I anymore. Um, so I always felt like there was stuff on the table. Uh, but honestly, like half of it is just to have the arrogance to think that we can try to recreate the wire in a comic book. I don't know if you guys have seen the show. Yeah. Oh yeah. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> the wire oh, it has that feel. Feel. Absolutely. The greatest show of all time. Uh, yes. definitely top for those who, uh, haven't seen it, but, um, yeah, yeah I mean, it was, just, it was really tough. beyond me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it like was, was say, up that, against that one, wasn't it? Like, yeah. Yeah. But like it, one year they should just gave it to him. Like they, like the wire for him Leo. So Oscars for his worst movies, The Wire should have won something, in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, uh, Better Call Saul never won anything, right? That's also true. Yeah, they were nominated for forty-five nominations. Yeah, and not a single win. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, sometimes like if you're not in the zeitgeist, you know, like in the right way, you just don't oh, get it. True. But that's fine. Like it's like. like Growing up during the Tom Brady era, he was the only one that ever win. And how many great quarterbacks like Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers? Like, right. I'm not bitter at all. What about Eli Manning, bro? What yeah, about yeah. two rings? He was our only savior. Gosh, it's true. God bless. Two and zero, baby. Two and zero against Tom. God bless him. You know what? <laughs> yeah. I can't even hate against that. <laughs> no, you you can't. But with, with two issues left, though, obviously there's a lot of moving parts still left to be had. And just going in with this, obviously, like you touched upon, no one is a whole different kind of promotion for this. And especially doing this with a podcast companion piece, which is, like I say, it, it adds so much to the story, too. In with this, like, do you think this is like the next evolution of comic book, like promotion and, and storytelling? I mean, it's not cheap to do, so I don't I don't know. You know, I mean, not unless it's part of a bigger play, you know, I, I think that. um I think it could be. I think looking at, at entertainment and media in this way, I think I think Kyle's super smart and has always has one eye on on figuring it out. You know, he's a millennial, so maybe he's more on the, the pulse. You know, um, but uh, I think I think it's a really it's a really good way to look at, at entertainment. You know, uh, how can we you know how can we maximize the experience? I mean, everyone's going crazy about the the uh, the Apple uh, vi- you know the Apple thing. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen it yet, yeah. but, but you know, I'm sure that's going to open up avenues for ways to communicate, you know, to, to experience entertainment. So I don't know, man. It is. Yeah. It, you, I was just going to say, I think you yeah. see a lot more people, like a lot bigger creators, like a lot of name recognition people like yourself going more towards these creator owned things, which I think is starting to catch a lot of people's attention. So I think it's going to be one of those, like, maybe it's not now, like you said, it's opening doors. And every pioneer starts somewhere. And I think that's what you guys are doing right now. And it's, it's awesome because we're going to be able to eventually look back and be like, this moment is when it all started issues. Like no one issues like midlife. Sure. I mean, I, one, one can hope, right. I, I think we do it because we love the, the process. Like I write because I love it. Right. Like, you know, I'm just super fortunate that I actually get to support my family doing what I love, you know, like I actually love writing. I, you know, it took me a long time to learn how to write. It took me probably 10 years, eight to 10 years to be good at, it, you know, before I ever got my first chance. So like I wrote a lot for free. Um, it's nicer to write stuff and then get money at the end. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, I would do it even if I didn't, you know, even if I wasn't making money. So um, I think that, you know, I think well, you, like, you, like to, you like to think that that shows in your work, like your passion for the thing you're doing, you know? Oh, I think it definitely does, especially for, you know, something like midlife and Ruben and now kind of going from that creator focus back to the, uh, the man, if you will, we have another really big book that you're doing right now, which is justice league versus Godzilla versus Kong, which I am an absolute sucker for. Mm -hmm. I, I almost feel like when you're writing for yourself in midlife, I feel like you're writing for me in this book. Uh, The second (laughs) I picked it up, man, how did this production come about? Because Godzilla and Kong are like next to, you know, superheroes. They're the hottest thing right now. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, existence has nothing to do with me. Uh, uh, ben Abernathy, who was a uh, editor at, at DC at the time and Robert Mackin, who runs the, the Kong side of legendary, <clears throat> they just started talking and they were like, we should do a team up. And, and you know, I mean, what started out is prob- probably like a big lawyer thing because, you know, uh, lots of rights issues. Uh, Toho, you know, owns the rights to Godzilla and you know, all, all those things, you know. 
they worked it out and, and uh, they got a green light to, to go ahead and make a series. And I was the lucky son of a bitch that they uh, asked first. So <laughs> Now that you've really already it. started to answer the question I was going to go for, what is it like having all these houses all together? You know, it's like, Hey, here's my story. No, Godzilla doesn't do that. <laughs> you know, where, where, like, I see you playing in the DC sandbox and you're pulling out like all the great toys. We get that. But how, sure. Or do you, do you, you know, one thing is uh, with a lot of these smaller series right now, like we're used to a lot of series having five issues each, you know, sure. and I know that this one's getting ran out to seven. And I can say with what everything you've got out right now, I appreciate the fact that you're pacing, you know, that you're not just slamming it all in, in one issue. I mean, I'm not saying things didn't happen sure, sure. in one and two, but how is it for you having to pace yourself and work within the lines that the different companies have given you, sure. Universal and Toho. It's been remarkably easy. Uh, oh. Like there are certain things that they have like certain lines, like, you know, um, things with Godzilla, like, you know, Superman can't pick him up and fly him somewhere, right? Like they just won't allow that. Or, or you know, um, I was hoping to use some oh. other um, monsters that actually we couldn't use because it wasn't in the contract. So there's yeah. things like that, that I had to like make pivots because of that, because of branding, you know, branding issues or legal issues. But like, in terms of like, just being able to go out and do what I want, it's shocking how soon it's gone, how easy it's gone. Like there's some things that we do, like I'm surprised that they're like, really, you, you guys, where's the note? I can do this, okay, all right. You know, like like we did some some crazy things, like issue seven, I turned the script and I was like, I think I went overboard. Like, this is crazy. This is a crazy issue. Like, How so, can you go so. overboard with everything you, you're, you're writing? There? There's, is there really overboard? Well, I say it's overboard because like, I feel like uh, part of the idea was 30 pages an issue to give the artist the chance to do the scale and the scope, you know? And, and then by like issue six and seven, like rather than having like a bunch of like, you know, splash pages or, or, you know, two and three panel pages or five and six, you know, mm -hmm. so like in some ways, like sorry, you know, sorry, uh, but you know, I I create I I built up so many different threads and so many characters. I don't know why no one told me to throw that many characters into it. I just did it. You're um, good. Geez. What? Listen, I'm I, down for more. I mean, I want to see how crazy this can get because honestly, it's really impressive the amount of you know villains you have, and then you've got there's there's so many different angles, and somehow it's working extremely yeah. smooth and seamless. And I think yeah. that's a testament to your writing. I, I it's amazing. Comp, uh, yesterday for issue. Oh man, five. look at that! That's beautiful. So, I meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, I can spoil. You want a spoiler? Let's see if I can. Oh, Absolutely, I will never turn. Yeah, I mean, especially for this, I love this story so much. Well, first it, of all, uh, uh, guess yeah. right, where, what reference I gave him for this right here? Can you... Jaws. Yep. yep. Yes. <laughs> Not that clear, but yeah, I was like, do this. <laughs> Um, but it's it's funny, you know, I was one of your other massive verse writers who has worked on certain other crossovers that uh, Ken absolutely knows which one I'm talking about mm -hmm. has kind of gotten uh, there is an interview floating around with him and I and he's like, you're going to get me in trouble because he I did. I called him out and said, yo, who pigeonholed you into this particular uh, thread that you had to stick to? And he's like, you can't say that, Tom. I said, <laughs> I, I did. That's why my name is off the cuff. <laughs> yeah but I, I think but you know like look I, i've done i've done ip before i've done like licensing things and sometimes they put you in the box like i, I did a I, I did a kong i did the kong graphic novel that takes place between uh godzilla versus kong and godzilla you know x hunted kong haunted the new one right and there were a lot of constraints because it had to fit slot oh, exactly yeah. in between two movies without revealing a bunch of stuff. Like, I got to see the movie and there's some crazy awesome shit that happens God, in, so in the new God movie. Him. But like, I, I can't refer to any of that. It, doesn't, it takes place, you know, right there. So um, that does happen. But in this case, in Else Worlds, I was allowed to pick, like Ben just was like, go for it. You know, like like once I turned to my outline, like literally it was little things, little, little tiny things. So like, it was amazing. The best experience I ever had working on, on licensed characters working on TC is wild.
Wow. Who's the, oh. the one character so far that you were like, there's no way in hell they're going to let me get this character. Okay, I hold on. Them. What does it look like on Grodd? On Grodd's Planet, uh, Planet of the Apes. Oh, uh, That's a kryptonite horn. Yeah, kryptonite horn. Yeah, kryptonite horn. That's right. That's my, Yo. Next, uh, that's my one spoiler. So here you go. There you go. Oh man! I can't look at the one look at it. That's la, 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 la. amazing. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. We're getting we're getting spoiled spoiler tonight, for folks. You. If you're if you're not in here on this stream right now, oh man! Oh goodness! You just had to be there. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. uh, you, there, there was a question coming. Sorry. Oh no! I was saying like, who's the one character that you're like? There's no way on this planet they're gonna let me throw this person or creature or whatever in here. And you're they're like sure. And you were like, wait, what? Is there anyone? There's not that they, they wouldn't let me do it. Like, there's a couple choices I made with characters and their powers and stuff that I, uh, that was very surprising that they let me do. Like, I, I wish I could spoil. Like, when we're offline, if you want me to spoil, I'll tell you stuff. Um, but like, uh, I, I can't. I, there's, I can't. I don't want to spoil it because they're gonna make a big announcement on one on one. Uh, it's one thing I'm thinking of, oh. and then the other thing I'm thinking of is um. Is the is the ending? Like, you know, like it's solving the crime kind of thing. So uh, I don't want to. Yeah. Can Can I put an idea sure. in your head? Sure. Okay. If you do get a part two with this, <laughs> kaiju size crypto. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty oh, good. Man. Um, that would be amazing. <laughs> look at that. I mean, look at the cover. Look at that. If you're not reading this story, like I I know it's easy like for me to gush and it's just i i'm simple i'm simple i love kaijus i love monsters read this more importantly though like if this is what brings you into brian's you know work then please make sure you're also picking up no one make sure you're picking up midlife because if you think that's good just see what he can do with his own characters and the things that he gets to play in his sandbox and uh man it's it's really incredible having read all of these um you're killing it, man. Like, I, I don't know how to say it. Like, you're absolutely, I'm glad you said you took a break and I'm glad you came back to comic books for, for fans like myself or fans like Ken and Tom. Mm -hmm. Like, we just got to say thank you for coming back and making that choice. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, it, it's not always easy, right? Like, you know, when you leave, people forget about you uh, on, on both sides of the aisle, you know, uh, the, the, the consumers, the material and the people who, you know, have the jobs. So it's not always easy, but, um, you know, uh, I, I do wish that I probably had stuck around you know, and, and kept a, a more solid foot in. Um, uh, what had happened was when I was in the tail end of Justice League, uh, Injustice, I got into the um, Universal uh, Feature Writers Program, which is a paid um, program uh, like where you, like, you wrote two scripts for Universal, you were an employee, you learned sort of uh, feature film development from the studio side. And because they saw that I was working for Warner Brothers on paper, they, they told me I had to quit my comics if I was going to accept the Universal. Oh, um, man. oh man. And, and so I took that as like the sign. Okay, well, I guess maybe now this is, I'm going to be the movie guy, you know? Um, and it was very, it was a great experience. I met a lot of people, you know, uh, I, I considered it a success um, and, you know, had opportunities. Um, but like it kind of pushed me away from, uh, uh, from comics. And, you know, when, when you're doing the grind of, of uh, film oh. television, like even, even if they pay you for, you know, you sell something and you option it or you get to get the chance to be paid to write a feature or, or, a, or a pilot or whatever, the odds of it ever coming out are very, very slim. Like oh, yeah. Just super, super slim. Like I, I was in a, a TV debater in 2019 got paid, you know, good money. At least I felt it was like, like it was good money to develop a show. And they never, mm -hmm. even, they never even took the show out. That we, there, was a, there was eight of us we all were like you know like diverse voices this great experience create your own show put your stamp on it and then they you know because whatever the venture said they they decided not to even try to sell the show and it's like that's why you can only do that so many times before you're like well if i go back to comics at least even if it's only a thousand two thousand five thousand people reading it somebody's reading somebody's experiencing what i'm what you're creating that's the hardest part about about the industry like creating things that nobody ever gets to see or, or experience mm -hmm. on any level. So um, doing it in, in comics, it's just like, there's nothing like it, you know? I've been yeah. fortunate enough to have two, you know, mediocre, low budget movies made in the, in the past couple of years for Paramount. Um, and those experiences are great. 
but there's so many choices that are made that are not mine. And they make, you know, you write the script yeah. and then they make the movie and then they edit the movie. You know, so like, you know, the amount of control you have of comics is, is unparalleled. Oh, with, without a doubt. Yeah. You have a lot more, I mean, sometimes we always have a boss, but I, I definitely feel like in TV and movies, you have less creative control versus comic books, which like you mentioned, it's, it's very easy to get burned out on. Yeah. And there's so much money at stake. Like, of course, and when, when you're talking millions of dollars being spent in a direction, like, of course, you're not going to have a say, like, you know, the, it's hard to be an author in life and be successful. And especially in, in the, the, in this age, where those movies just don't get made because they don't have a life in the way that they used to on video, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to just think about that, but even with comics and especially creator owned, I mean, you, you really have nothing holding you back from really doing a crazy idea. And then when you have to work, you know, like I say, with movies and TVs, there's just more people involved because of the, the business side of things more so than the creative side. And then going into this, like I say, with the three books that we just talked about now, I mean, you can tell by reading them, obviously, there's a lot of heart behind them. There's a lot of, you know, emotion and a lot of happiness with them, too, because you can definitely tell, especially Justice League versus Kong versus Godzilla. Like, you can tell how much fun you're having writing that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, how can you not? Like, you know, how can I not put put Hal and, and, and Barry together to, to, you know, be like, you know, a little married couple, you know, talking shit to each other? How can I not? try to come up with an interesting sort of hook with Superman and Lois and, and try to ground it in something emotional, right? Like, it could very easily be a throwaway. I didn't think it was going to be this, this successful, like selling out and, and each issue sold out and multiple printings and stuff like that. I had no idea it was going to resonate like that. But I'd like to think that it got a really good word of mouth because – you know, I, I cared about the story. I, I wasn't just, you know, this wasn't just a paycheck. Like I had the opportunity to, to, you know, pool all these resources, all these cool creative things, these, these IP and make something cool out of it, you know, and, and, you know, have you be in on the fun? Like some of it's absurd, of course, you know, but Kaiju are gigantic creatures. Superman shoots lasers out of his eyes. Like, like, you the know, whole serious and, and not supposed to be serious. Like, yeah, the, the, the six can be real. But you can also understand what it is and, and just sort of embrace that, you know? Well, now also, you're saying uh, how successful oh, everything's been going with this. Is there any idea or inkling that there will actually possibly kind of maybe sort of be a sequel to the series? Conversations are happening. Conversations okay. are happening. I, I know that there are parties that would like it to happen. So Write hoping, your congressman, you know? people. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping, you know. Send your yeah, letters to President to, Lupin. Uh, I can't wait to the first, you know, so it's all collected. I think it's going to be so awesome to have that, you know. And it's going to be enormous because it's going to be 210 pages of, of uh, story. Just pure awesomeness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, this will be sitting on my coffee table as soon as that big old hardbound comes out. I'm just going to go. Yeah, I've been buying well, every issue, but I'm also a sucker for just like getting all of them collected together sure. in a trade and getting a read through. Yeah. So I know for a fact. And actually, funny enough, my, uh, my eight-year-old son, he's been you know he's second grade so he's his reading's not the best but this is the one comic book he will actually sit down and he will read from start to finish and uh -huh. he picks up he's in a massive godzilla phase right now too and so like he's a he's not a bad big. place to be no he's just wicked big into this entire run so i gotta say thank you as a father who loves comic oh, yeah. books this is kind of like a bonding moment from him to i getting to sit there and read every month the justice league versus godzilla and kong run oh that's awesome oh, that's awesome it's really really great I mean, I, I even share when I'm when I'm reading the books, you know, I'm, I'm doing digitally. There's parts where I go, honey, look. And with yours, she knows the characters. She knows her Denzel. <laughs> she knows her Kong. You know, she knows her, her Justice League. Um, she is not just, a, a, you know, a nerdy woman. She is a, my nerdy wife. So she knows these characters. So <laughs> seeing that, you know, <laughs> that you did at Soups, because I think we can talk about that now. Uh, she went, oh, snap. And then I Did turn it? to the next page and I see big old bad boy Adam Smasher. I'm like, hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing about this comic is like every time you turn the page, you're in for a treat. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's going to pop up. And you're legitimately in for a fun surprise. And it's going to be well drawn, very beautifully, visually gorgeous. And mm -hmm. then you're going to have those fun quips, man. It's 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 very lighthearted. And that's that's at the core of what superheroes and what kaiju are. That's what it's supposed to be about. 
I agree. Mm-hmm. And I, I think my my stint on injustice helped helped me with that because I, that was my first experience dealing with so many you know multiple characters and and really like you know else worlds you know like having fun in in the DC universe right and you know those books still sell like there there's they're evergreen people still find them and, and yeah <laughs> Ken Ken, yeah. Ken likes the injustice a bit my yes wife's that is one of my favorites too. yeah. My favorite properties, yes. I yeah, I could I could rave about injustice all day. Yeah. But you know, obviously we've covered three books here for you. What future projects can we look forward to in twenty twenty four for me? Um so I'm right now I'm lead writer on a uh, an interactive series, which is sort of like an animated series meets uh like a telltale, like a bandersnatch uh choice based uh thing. Uh, and so it's uh, for, it's called DC Heroes United. It was announced in at, at New Yorkon, mm-hmm. um, and it's like this sort of straight interesting interactive merging yeah. of an animated series and like um, uh, you know if you play like The Walking Dead or Telltale, like you know how you, you get choices, yeah. and, and then like, like you know, your you own choices. choices. And, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. So each episode, you get like uh, four choices. Yeah. You watch the episode. There's four choices in it, and then you yeah. have a week to vote. Um, and uh, you're not you're not playing or experiencing it yourself. You're part of a community, so everyone votes. Like, you know, Robin Little Die kind of thing, uh, and it resolves in the next episode, and that becomes canon. So it's sort of like the idea of like like you know you guys always wanted to con- you know to control what happens in a story, and you think you can write it better. Well, here's your chance. Like you can mold, you can shape who joins the Justice League. You can shape is Lex either going to be a hero or a villain. Like is this person redeemable? Uh, the choices that you make, uh, like you know, there's a math equation to it, but like it, it drives these characters down a path that by the end of the story, you know, you the viewers are responsible for how it ends. And so it's been, I it's been I've been on the project for quite a while, and it's it's you know. It's some learning because it's kind of a newish thing, um, but uh, that's coming out next year. Um, I signed a deal. You can for fix a, Guy uh, Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Potentially, potentially. Oh my god! Or kill him? Maybe just kill him. Um, <laughs> Equally as good. <laughs> um, yeah. Then I, I, I just signed a, a, a contract to do a book with Mad Cave. And uh, Matteo Mong, who was the artist in Chicken Devil's Volume Two, so I don't know when that's coming out. We're we're having a kickoff okay. meeting, I think, on Monday. Um, but uh, that one is kind of a action fun. You guys will like it. I'll tell you about it offline. <laughs> we know we know Mad Cave. Uh, <laughs> we do, we do know Mad Cave, and we're going we to lock you in when that book comes out. Uh, if you're not back here sooner, we're definitely going to be doing a turn a page about that book for you. Fair enough. So let's do I that. Oh, absolutely. And before we let you go, just a little fun way out the door. You did mention about Eli Manning and the Super Bowl. Obviously, we just had oh, the game man. go down. What was your take from this past week's uh, Super Bowl? Uh, you know, I think it's just a couple of key mistakes turned that game. I think, I think you know, there was, there was. It's okay. Know, you can man. say it. You were all glad the 49ers lost as a Packer fan. Thank God that team lost. We can say I, it. I, I like Patrick Mahomes. So, like, I, 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 I like, I'm a fan of either team, but I like Patrick Mahomes. I think he's a great quarterback. Uh, I like what he does. I like the way he, the way he quarterbacks. Yeah. So, for my takeaway was like, I was shocked that they, that, that they let the clock run down for one play. Like, that was like, yeah, the balls to do that. I was like, like I was like, why are they calling timeout? And someone's like, well, they want the corners uh, to reset their defense. I'm like, okay, I get that, but just one or play. Like what? Like you got we, taking one shot at it. There was three Yo, seconds the left. Stones. I'm to my wife, like, why is there no timeout? Like, what are we doing? The stones, man. Yeah, that that was wild, yeah. wild. Yeah, that whole game. Um, the fact the 49ers stopped running in the second half still blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, like you, you had the, the the freak punt that off the guy's ankle, oh, like like you couldn't count for that, um, you know. But then you also had uh, was it Pacheco? You know, Pacheco was muffling, fumbling. Yeah, fumbling. Holmes yeah, threw yeah. an interception. Like, yeah, it's a game of inches, and uh, there's a lot of opportunities. You know, really, both some ways. say. <laughs> 
Some say, yeah. yeah. So as long as it's not right. the, uh, least... you know, the Patriots winning, I'm good. True. It's it's funny because I'm from I'm from Boston, but I, I'm not a Patriots fan. I'm every Boston sports fan besides the Patriots, and fair enough. The happiness we'll, I we'll, we'll have some problems. <laughs> uh, I'm the uh, Yankees Knicks, so you know, yeah, yeah. Celtics. Don't Celtics. Don't Let's go. We're living right now, Celtics right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you yeah. can see that. But, uh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So there, there we go. Oh, that's okay. awesome, dude. That's, that's have, the uh, one from from 1970. So oh, where's that? We're not oh, showing chess. I got I got the B. So right there we go. So hey, you. all right. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. I also got Flash. Right. Hey, I do too. <laughs> We're showing tats. Hold on. I got. I got. Yeah, all, right. all right. Here we go. But this this is how you know I was destined this is, to write this book. Right, Who's that? Here we go. We got Flash, Aquaman, Batman. See oh man. <laughs> I, I, I got my Dicky Power man. Ranger tattoo. Very specific one. <laughs> so <laughs> extremely specific Ranger tattoo. How about Fair you, enough. Ken? <laughs> I, I've got nothing. I'll, I'll go find a turn into uh, a tattoo off. <laughs> yeah, I'll go find the the rupier sticker there and put it on. That's all. Don't I worry, got. I'll send you some some stick in with a washcloth, and there you go, some temporary tats. There you yeah, go. We'll Next time he'll be all tatted look. up. Yeah, we'll look at mine. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. just have two sleeves on. We'll go from there. <laughs> uh, but Brian, thank you again for coming on. In the liner notes yeah. of this episode, we will have links to make sure you go get midlife. Go get no one. Go get Justice League versus Kong versus Godzilla, and how to get in touch with Brian on the social media because he definitely want to go follow hey, him and go the, support these books. The um, the cover, the first the first issue for Midlife. Anyone recognize the reference for that cover? Very very recent reference. Super recent. Oh God, Ted Lasso. Like, wow. Yes, sir. No, no. It was Ted Lasso. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, that show is <laughs> everything. That show is everything. To that, me. That's Thank a soccer ball. That would be just, yeah. So, that's well amazing. Done. Good job, Tom. I'm no, like this I say, is why the pop culture good. connoisseur, my friend. Yes. <laughs> but like I say, you need to go pick these books up. You need to have them in your collection. You need to have an extra copy too to hand off to somebody because honestly, they are that good. Yeah. Trust me, from somebody that buys them every time they drop. Yeah. And yes. like I say, go support Brian and everything he's doing, and especially with that Mad Cave book comes out. We're going to yes. book that for this show right now. And we definitely have to have you come on and talk about that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime. No, thank you. And all right, so we'll just get out of here. Tom, how's the fine folks find out what's going on with you and everything off the cuff? As the guy in the chair has already put it up here, uh, off the cuff, Tom, the pop culture kind of store. You can find me right there at the QR code, everything else going on on the holy social medias. And follow that up. Don't forget to check me out in March. I will be at Syracuse Collectors Con uh, with all my Power Ranger buddies. And uh, it's going to be a good time. All right, Matt. Yeah, man, right there, over there, wherever my finger points. Yeah, next to Tom. See, that's where we're at. Every every uh, social media account, every podcasting platform, we're starting a new like live happy hour show, Lauren and I, like this Thursday, at, right after our Patton Oswalt interview, because what is life? We're, we're going to be uh, talking about the Deadpool trailer, for example. And then you can go ahead and find me at GalaxyCon Richmond. I will actually be having a panel on the history of Batman. And then uh, at AwesomeCon, the week before that, I will be with uh, Tony doing an MCU panel. So that's where you'll find me, and I'll be there. Absolutely. And for me, and anything going on with the ODPH, you can find out the QR code. We love QR codes here at Nerd Initiative. So you can click on that, odphpodcast.com. Two new episodes out. New comic book reviews are dropping. And if you want to talk comic book reviews, well, Nerd Initiative has you covered starting at 9 a.m. every Tuesday and Wednesday, the latest and greatest at the comic shops. If we don't have it on there, you don't need it in your collection, folks. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm doing Justice League and Kong next week. Can't That's wait. a little bit of a spoiler. Yes, <laughs> uh, I have a feeling that might be leading off the coverage on Tuesday. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, because uh, the books are that good. So if you want to find out what the bullpen has to say about that, like we say, every Tuesday, Wednesday, starting at 9 o'clock in the morning, every 15 minutes, uh, you have new reviews dropping. So if you need to know what to pick up at the shops, we have you covered. And then with everything going on with Nerd Initiative Streaming, there's a simple homework assignment that the guy in the chair puts up there. And that is to make sure you click on the subscribe button. Make sure to hit that bell notification to make sure you don't miss when episodes like this drops. And tap that like button because the bosses at Nerd Initiative love to see when you're liking the contents. We get more guests on, talk more comics, talk more pro wrestling like Wrestling Night Live every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the guy in the chair himself, Rich. And myself and Nick, our latest team member, because we have a lot to talk about WWE, AEW. Brian, do you follow any pro wrestling? I did when I was much younger. I'm talking like Hulk Hogan, like you know, Mr. Wonderful. Okay. Ah, Fair yes. enough. 
So, uh, so I had a particular interest in, in the Iron Claw because uh, my dad lived in Texas, so so I watched oh. Steve Erickson when I was a kid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not seen that movie yet. Surprisingly, pretty good movie. Very good. Sadly, not as uh, strangely not as tragic as the life their life was even. Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. If, if you know the story, man, it's, it's wild. It's amazing. Brutal. Yeah. And then, lastly, certainly not least, anything Nerd Initiative. Make sure to hit that QR code. Contact Nerd Initiative. Your home of pop culture positivity. We have a lot of stuff lined up for 2024, so you're going to be seeing a lot more reviews, a lot more content, a lot more fandoms, keeping it positive, and keeping it all about growing a community that is centered around that pop culture positivity. That is what we do here at Nerd Initiative. So on behalf of everybody here, remember, when you're at the comic shops and you have a great issue in your hands, such as Midlife, such as No One, such as Godzilla and Justice League and Kong, that issue. and you see somebody struggling to pick one up, hand it off to them. Tell them to turn a page. We'll see you guys next week. It's such waste of time Swiping left and swiping right On people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn Be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light Find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me We don't have to blow the moon on the open sea Don't know that I believe in the old time fables Everyone has just one True love All I know is you're across this table And you're all I'm thinking of So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me We don't have to float alone on the open sea Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know.